Okay, so I'm just going to turn left and take it out here to the, well, more or less to the south and just head in that direction and then fly on back. I'm watching the Ox Intake Doors indicator. They're still open. My airspeed is starting to increase. So we'll see at what point they actually do close. And I can also go on my radar to the operate position. And now I'm in the 40 mile scan. I don't think I have anything remaining airborne. I sort of modified this mission. You might have noticed the uh, Huey that landed next to me in the first segment. Uh, for the second little segment, I removed that because it just made an awful racket. And I think there are still F5s around, but I know that they land. They should be landing here in a little bit. I saw a C-130 on takeoff, but yeah, I don't think anything else is really going to be airborne. Okay, there we go. Ox intake doors have closed, as expected. I really didn't have a, a set number in mind on that. And Tekan is, my station is still out there to the left at 3.5 miles. Okay, so yeah, I'm just going to circle here, come up with something to look at here next. So I will be back in just a bit. Okay, so first up, I'll just run through the climb procedure as called out in the manual here. External fuel slash auto balance as required. Now earlier we had already seen that we did not need to enable the external fuel tank until the left was below 1700 and the right was below 2300. They are down below that, so I will enable the external fuel switch. And that, okay, so my fuel quantity is there increased rapidly. I don't know if that's normal or not, unless there is like a, a lot of fuel instantaneously applied to the tanks, but my indication that the external fuel tanks or tank is empty is going to be a caution light, and that's where I'll disable the switch and then just be worrying about the uh, fuel quantity. And at that point also, I'm going to start to use this auto balance switch to uh, balance out the left and right tanks. Okay, so zero delay linger, disconnect above 2,000 feet. That's not going to be applicable for us. And warning, ejection above 400 indicated with the linger connected can't cause parachute, can't be failure. Yep, any, anyway, that's why you would connect it. Oxygen to the normal uh, position. So yeah, this is at normal, this is at normal. And verify, yeah, it is on. Cockpit pressurization check. And I would have, I think in the, the full manual, there's probably a, a cockpit pressurization schedule. So I would compare my like barometric altitude. I'm up through, geez, already 13,000 feet to my cockpit pressure or my like interior uh, equivalent pressure altitude. And I'm at about 9,000 right now. So that sounds pretty reasonable to me. Okay, altimeter as required. There's all sorts of little aviation things that I'm not going to get into as far as when and how to set a different altimeter settings. I'm just going to leave it at 2992 regardless and uh, let the experts worry about exact FAA and ICAO procedures there. I, I, I'm just more of an aircraft systems guy and not an aviation guy, which I'm sure is evident to a lot of people. So we have a section here on fuel balancing. And let me, let me scope this out a little bit. And I think once we get to the point where we want to balance out the fuel, I'll come back to this. And then cruise, perform level up and operational checks and check altimeter. And then we get into descent type stuff. So I'm just going to hang out here for a little bit, relax, look around, and I'll be back in a little bit. Okay, I'm back with you a few minutes later. I've pulled the throttle back a little bit and I'm just sort of cruising at 19,000 feet. One other thing I'm going to do is since I am just sort of cruising configured for endurance, I'm going to put my flap switch out of auto into the fixed position. Now that's going to have a different, I guess, schedule when it comes to the AOAs and airspeeds where the flaps go to the different settings. I'll bring it up here in the manual, I suppose. Yeah, the section we want is the one with the E3 effectivity up here, and that's page 1-74. So, uh, let's see here. Fixed flaps provide reduced fuel consumption and improved buffet control when the aircraft is flown at reduced speed for maximum endurance with stores loaded. Uh, so you can uh, see the different, uh, I guess, little control laws right there. Well, that's a dangerous term to use since that has different meanings and different applications. But you can see in general when and where and why the different settings are used right there. Auto flaps is just for, well, just for normal operation. That's just going to be optimized for, just say, maneuverability of the aircraft. So I think I've also talked a little bit about the flap system in general. It's just electrically controlled by some 
motors, and it mentions here the CADC, or Central Air Data Computer, that controls it all. So it's just, as you can see, very, very user-friendly, and I don't even have to think about it at all, other than just to remember to put it from auto to fixed whenever I want to conserve fuel like I am right now. Now, I'm heading, I'm heading south. I've never actually flown south, I don't think, out of Tbilisi. And I'm coming up on, let me see, I think I'm coming up on both the Albanian and the Azerbaijani borders right here. And yeah, I can see, looking out there in the distance, this is really where the, the terrain sort of stops. But I'll turn around and start heading back to base. And if I took it, I'll take it around and start to fly out there to the east, I guess. If I kept going in that direction, we would eventually reach the Caspian Sea and the uh, port of Baku, the big oil uh, like Georgia, a uh, big oil rich area, this entire uh, stretch through here. But at this point, yeah, we're really not that far from our airfield at all. 31 miles based on the tack end. I've got the needle right there. Now, I guess just to just to do some tack end navigation, let's just say, for example, that I want to approach it from a specific course. Now, what I could do is, uh, you know, let's just say that I wanted to approach from due south and fly due north I would just come around here and I can see that the course deviation bar is over here it'll once we straighten out be to the right so I just want to basically keep flying to the right of the tachan pointing needle until this course deviation bar centers up and at that point then I'll be flying at exactly a 358 course towards the tachan station but again I'm not really interested in the aviation type stuff I'm just going to roll that out right there and start to set up and do some different stuff here. Now, I'm still waiting on that external fuel tank to drain. There's a lot of fuel in there. I've been flying for, well, not too long. It'll probably take another 15, 20 minutes here in real time. I'll, of course, cut some of this out. And then I'll start to do some auto balancing. And I'll probably try to time this so that I land with, well, relatively, relatively little fuel. And here we go, talking about the uh, the tech end earlier. So yeah, there we go. The course deviation needle is starting to center back up. I can actually lead it a little bit and start to make the turn right now. And that's going to put us you know, overflying it at a course of 358. Now, of course, we could also use this to line us up on the runway like we did earlier. Now, I think the, I can't even remember what the actual runway heading was. I think it was 30, uh, 304. So same concept here. I'm flying basically directly at the tech end station so what I want to do is bank right and fly to the right of the tech end station I'll probably roll it out at about 045 or so on my heading or a heading of 45 degrees between the 3 and the 6 right there and fly on that heading and then once I'm lined up on the runway then I can just turn and be directly lined up with the runway without ever having to have seen it And I'm up through about 21,000 feet, so I'm just going to plug in a little bit of nose down trim. Actually, I can uh, trim nose down a little bit and pull the throttle back a little bit as well to level myself off. I'm still climbing at a, a fairly good clip right here. So what else do I have going on here? Yep, cabin, pressure altitude, uh, stabilized at about 8,000 feet. And I'll pull up the dash one. Well, not to necessarily question anything that's going on, just to educate myself on how this works and what kind of pressure schedule is used. And okay, as I was looking through the manual there to do some more ECS stuff, we have our external fuel tanks empty light on. And what really caught my eye and made me notice it in the first place was the master caution light. So I'm going to depress the master caution light to extinguish it. And then I'm going to go external fuel tank switch off and that's going to extinguish the light. And now I can see that I have an imbalance between the left and right fuel system. The left side is low, so I go to the left low position on this auto balance switch and that's going to start to make the right hand fuel system drain quicker. And then once these are starting to balance up, then this switch is going to automatically center back up. So I'll just have to look down there and periodically tweak the switch as required as I found myself in a right hand turn out here probably over Azerbaijan without even without even realizing it but okay let me uh, let me get back into the manual I was trying to look at the uh, cabin pressurization system the schematic really wasn't doing much for me there I need to get into the text so I'll be right back 
Okay, I'm back, and what was really, I guess, puzzling me on the schematic is that for some reason I was expecting a separate air source for pressurization, a sort of separate from the conditioned air air source, but yeah, it's all the same source. It's, I don't, don't know why that was puzzling me. That just makes perfect sense to me now. So the same, I guess, cabin air distribution ducting air source is what pressurizes it, and then the pressure altitude is just maintained by a cabin pressure regulator right here, so just based on the outside ambient pressure, that pressure regulator is going to maintain it at a regulated pressure. And if I come to the real dash one, it's on page one dash one forty, that chart for cabin pressurization schedule I was looking for. So the way this works is that okay, we're at sixteen thousand three hundred feet more or less. So I just come over here to sixteen thousand, draw a line over to the first line, and then draw a line down to the second line, and that's going to tell me that my cabin pressure should be at about 8,000 feet. And if I come over to the cabin pressure, yeah, it's exactly at 8,000 feet. So uh, what happens is that the cabin pressure matches the outside ambient pressure all the way up to 8,000. And then that regulator keeps it at 8,000 all the way until we get to, yeah, about 23, 24,000 feet. And then the cockpit altitude starts to increase based on the outside pressure. So yeah, you can see that yeah, everything is and has been all this time. Yeah, perfectly okay. So I'm flying through a cloud here. Let me see, where am I? I've been heads down for so long. Okay, 24 miles away, so the base is yeah, off to my right. And I'm down to, yeah, I've got the balance starting to come into balance here. I probably got another, I don't know, 20 minutes of flight time. If I, I had to guess, I could decrease that by descending, of course. But yeah, I'm just taking my time up here and having a look at things. I've got the field in sight all the fields around Tbilisi inside out there in front of me. Okay, so I think that's that's going to pretty much satisfy me, at least, on the ECS system. Now, I guess I never did look at, uh, look at the cabin pressurization switch right here. So basically, if I were to go up on this, it would just dump all the pressurized air just through like an emergency relief valve or just a ram air dump valve. But it's not something I would want to do in the real world. Let me just what I think is going to happen is once I go to ramp dump, then the cabin pressure altitude is going to come up immediately to match what the outside altitude is of 16,000 feet. Let me do that just for the sake of doing it. And there we go. That would have hurt a lot in the real world. You can see the cabin pressure altitude comes up to match the outside altitude. I'm going to go back to normal. But what happens there is that that uh, ram air dump valve closes the cockpit pressurizes based on the normal system and then that cabin pressure regulator starts to kick in and if I go down to defog only then I think what that does is just or actually no I know what that does is it prioritizes the defog system so it no longer provides the conditioned air to the cockpit it just throws all resources basically to defog and that would just be used uh, canopy fogging is uh, you get the impression I guess from DCS that you know all this stuff is not a big deal but yeah I, I can imagine at least that it would be a big deal and a big problem and that knowing the ECS system would be a lot bigger deal in the real world than it is in DCS for now it's just it really just has no function okay so that definitely does satisfy me now on the ECS okay oxygen quantity I'm down to I'm really blowing through that a lot faster than I thought I would I thought the uh, calculation or the chart said that I would have uh, many many hours of oxygen quantity, but let me see if it goes to the current rate I'll probably only have maybe two hours on there. That could be normal. I could just be missing something in the the operation of it And that's probably the case, but that is depleting the quantity a lot faster than I thought it would all the uh, all the switches are in the normal Yeah, normal oxygen and normal uh, flow setting. So yeah, I'm not sure